Yeah, no, I'm really not 100 years old. Um, uh, I, I'm, I'm younger than I look, obviously, but, uh, um, but um, I'm really thrilled to be here. And um, I wanted to say that I've been a, uh, a fan of Whiskate from the day uh, David came up with the idea. Um, I've been a um, <clears throat> super partisan fan of the University of Wisconsin-Madison for a very long period of time, but I haven't been here in over a decade. So I couldn't, I couldn't figure out where I was sometimes when Cliff and I were driving through this morning. And uh, I'm, I'm really a fan of, of Wisconsin, and I mean that seriously. I'm a guy from the East Coast who spent the last decade of my life in Indiana, and um, I really do uh, love this state. And I think one of the main reasons why this state is so important and so valuable is that it really is a, a hub of educational success. And go back to Diana's comments about the K-12 and higher ed uh, issues. I mean, if you think about uh, the rich history of Wisconsin, you know, everybody here knows that uh, it goes back to the time when the first kindergarten classes in the U.S. were held in 1856, uh, not too far from here in Watertown, and continues right up until this day, what I would argue is literally one of the best public universities in the country, uh, this university. So, you know, I think it only makes sense that we've gathered here today at this terrific university, <coughs> home to more than 40,000 students of great promise, to take on what I think is uh, the toughest and most urgent challenge of our time, ensuring that uh, America can unleash the talents of all of its citizens so that they can both survive and thrive in a challenging 21st century economy. Today, we all know that inequality is growing and social mobility is falling. And the long-term consequences are, I believe, dangerous to our democracy. One sobering statistic, I think, uh, tells the story. From the end of the Great Recession in 2010 to last year, the US economy added 11.6 million jobs. Of those 11.6 million jobs, 11.5 million of them went to people who have a post-secondary credential. To put it bluntly, the economic recovery never came to those in low-skill and low-wage jobs, and it never will. A good job, one that pays middle-class wages and offers a comfortable life with health care benefits and retirement savings, now requires post-secondary learning in our knowledge economy. Far too many people are being left behind in this economy. For them, we know that life can be ruthless. The consequences are very real. They were measured in that very sobering work on skyrocketing suicides and drug overdoses by Princeton economists Ann Case and Angus Deaton. You all know they called these deaths of despair. As the American dream fades for too many, our failure to increase the number of people earning post-secondary degrees and credentials looks more and more to be the culprit. I don't have all the answers, but I do know one thing. It's imperative that literally millions more Americans find success in learning after high school. These Americans have an abundance of talent to develop, and we need their skills, their smarts, and their drive to keep pace with the progress unfolding all around us. Now, we can argue ad nauseum about what really caused this crisis, but how we respond you and I is what matters. Because our task is clear and unequivocal. We must build a system of learning that's more equitable, more accessible, more responsive, and more accountable to the very people we've left behind. Now, there is some good news. So I want to make sure that we highlight some of the things that where we're making progress. And certainly here in Wisconsin, we're seeing signs of that progress in some important ways. Many in this state, including some of the leading experts in the country who are here today, who, who work at this university, are focused on increasing the number of people with post-secondary education credentials. That focus has paid off, as we've seen increases in degree attainment rates at the associate degree level and higher here in Wisconsin of more than five percentage points over the course of the last decade. That's good. State policy has supported this work by focusing on an ambitious goal, increasing uh, the percentage of Wisconsinites 
earning post-secondary credentials by 2027 to 60%. We believe that Wisconsin can reach that goal, and it's why Lumina Foundation is one of the places that supported the state, along with uh, a dozen others around the nation, to help speed progress. And I'm delighted to say that the state is at least making some efforts to try to make college more affordable for low-income students with a tuition promise program. Starting next fall, in-state students whose family make $56,000 or less will get free tuition here at UW-Madison. This is important and I think a good down payment on at least bridging some of that gap between the haves and the have-nots. And yet, our work is just beginning for people who can't afford access or navigate education beyond high school. Often, there are people of color and those living, uh, often these are people of color and those living at or just below the poverty line. <clears throat> Many are Hispanic, Latinx, African American, American Indian, Hmong, immigrants, other populations. Most are first generation students. Many are adults juggling two or three jobs and young children or ill relatives. Some struggle to find food or shelter, much less pay for their tuition. With demographic shifts in Wisconsin and across the nation, we're becoming more racially and ethnically diverse. The size of these populations is growing at precisely the time we need, we need more than ever for every person to fully participate in the civic and the economic life of our country. <laughs> Yet in Wisconsin, the percentage of whites with post-secondary degrees or credentials are more than double those of most of those populations that I mentioned. It's a huge gap and one that we have to address together. It represents tens of thousands of neighbors across Wisconsin who face an uncertain future. People we need to help create our common future. It's imperative that individuals in these groups add skills and credentials at significantly higher rates. At Lumina Foundation, we refer to this simply as the equity imperative. These historically underrepresented students and their families know the value of a college credential but too often they can't afford to take the next step or they get sidelined by obstacles large and small. It's our job to reach these students who hold so much potential and to help them succeed by developing and deploying their talent. Stated more plainly, equity isn't an important part of the work, it is the work. Now, it's not enough to just say we need more equitable outcomes for higher education. In fact, at Lumina Foundation, we heightened our focus on racial justice and equity as a specific element of that, going beyond Lumina's long-standing commitment to improving educational outcomes for African Americans, Hispanics, and American Indians, among others. In this historic climate, we need to think seriously about equity and about what it will take for higher education to assure everyone the opportunities that they need and they deserve. <coughs> Let's be honest. Too often, we think of these underrepresented students just like the students that we do serve effectively, except that they're lacking some little something. Don't get me wrong, we don't usually blame them for this, but we also don't think it's our fault either. The K-12 system failed them, or their parents didn't instill a love of learning, or they had the misfortune to be born poor. Whatever it is, too often we define the students by their deficits, and we think it's somebody else's responsibility to take care of this, so we can offer them a quality education just like everyone else. Now there's a lot that's wrong with that way of thinking. First, today's typical college student is no longer 18 years old, just out of high school, and headed straight to a four-year campus and a lifelong job. Consider this, today nearly 40% of today's students in American higher education today are over the age of 25. Increasingly, they're opting to learn in technical or community colleges. 13% of all students in the United States are learning entirely online. And more than 40% of students work more than 20 hours a week. Now add to that the harsh reality that many students are struggling literally just to survive. A new study done right here at the Wisconsin Hope Lab surveyed 43,000 students across 66 colleges, and it found that in the month before the survey, more than one in three students weren't sure where their next meal was coming from, and 9% were homeless. The numbers at community colleges are even higher. Now, 
And when I'm speaking with policymakers, influencers, and others about this, I try to put these facts in blunt terms. It's hard to study if you're hungry or cold or scared. It's hard to learn if you're hardly surviving. Most of these students are working to make ends meet, but it's impossible to work your way through college in a time-honored way with what we know is an inadequate minimum wage job. So it's not surprising that gradu graduation rates are so much lower for these students. Even students who are getting by face huge challenges. Think about the single mom or dad with young children. Think of the veteran who served two tours in Vietnam and isn't sure what comes next. Think of the out-of-work out of work auto worker or even the inmate who wants to turn his life around. Many of these people want higher education and they're willing to work hard for it. It's our job to help them succeed. So this is why Luna's equity imperative focuses on what higher education must actually need to do to uh, respond to the needs of today's students. We can start by looking at the many colleges and universities that actually are responding, but we need to figure out how to make their practices the norm rather than the exception. So my first rec recommendation is pretty simple. It's to pay closer attention to those students who need our help the most. Effective colleges do this by proactively offering them concierge or wraparound services. This may sound too easy or obvious, but it's already helping to improve student success rates and decrease those inequities. Both Wayne State University in Detroit and the University of Texas at Austin, for example, offer significant support for students whose odds of graduating are low. Instead of waiting for these students to ask for help, the schools provide it from the moment that they step on campus. The students get advisors, tutors, paid internships, and help them with everything from registration to time management. Food pantries at both of those schools are busy. In one month alone, Wayne State's pantry fed 900 students by providing 12,000 pounds of food. There are other, I think, similarly creative examples. The University of Houston gives grocery scholarships to those who need food assistance. Connecticut College, an elite liberal arts college, allows students to stay on campus for free during holiday breaks. It also provides laptops to those who arrive at college without one. And here at the university, mentoring is helping students like Sarah Yoon feel less alone. She told the media recently that mentors helped her after she realized she was the only woman of color in a high-level engineering class. Do such programs work? Evidence shows that students thrive when we have their backs. At UT Austin, it's cut its graduation rate gap for its poor students nearly in half, while boosting graduation rates for black and Hispanic students by about 50%. Along these same lines, we must also make sure that our post-secondary system is friendly and flexible for that other population I mentioned earlier, adults, especially adults who need to work. Education can't be the great equalizer if we literally leave half of these people behind. Here in Wisconsin, 48% of adults hold a post-secondary degree or certificate, which actually beats the national average. But when the vast majority of good jobs require post-secondary credentials, we can't tell these people, too bad, and write them off. To attract adults back to the classroom and keep them here, my second recommendation is to ensure clear, affordable, flexible, and interconnected pathways to learning. There must be plenty of on and off ramps, making it easier to transfer change course, and start again. It's critically important that we address the consistency, transferability, transparency, and quality of credentials, including badges, certificates, and, and degrees confirmed by educational institutions, in workplaces, by unions, the military, and more. In our talent-based society, it's intolerable not to capture people's learning. We must also reach out to those who, for whatever reason, uh, once decided that college wasn't for them, but now realize they now need that post-secondary credential. Whether they're immigrants or lifelong Wisconsin residents, we need to capture their experience. Credentials will be the currency of these skills, and it'll be how employers and workers find each other. 
This approach requires strong prior learning assessments and it requires competency-based education. It also helps to have a data system to monitor students' progress and actually help them stay on track. I like the University of Wisconsin's Flex program, which allows students to learn at their own pace, start and stop as they need to, and earn credit for on-the-job training. For instance, a computer science student can earn credits by showing she knows how to build a website. A nursing student can get credit for writing a plan to improve a patient's care. Meanwhile, Georgia State University has combined those personalized services we talked about with predictive analytics and a web-based tracking system. When a student signs up for a course that doesn't apply to his degree program, an alert goes off. A faculty advisor reaches out to the student the next day and gets the student in the right course before the first day of class. Over the last year, Georgia State had more than 2,000 of those types of corrections. As a result, the school has increased its six-year graduation rate from 32% in 2003 to 56% in 2014 and became the only national university in which black, Hispanic, first-generation, and low-income students graduated at rates at or above the rate of the student body overall, literally eliminating those equity gaps. The, these are, this is a great example of how I think technology, data, and truly hands-on student services combined can actually drive student success. Colleges are key players in this challenge, but frankly, you can't do this work alone. Every sector needs to come together in a big tent of collaboration, expertise, and resources to benefit students. So my third recommendation is that our revamped higher education system must work in genuine partnership with K-12, workforce agencies, employers, community organizations, labor unions, nonprofits, and policymakers. And yes, this will require investments from government and private enterprise to make education more accessible and affordable. Believe me, I realize that this is not easy in this kind of an environment. Since 2008, states per student spending on higher education has fallen 18% nationwide. The cuts have occurred in both blue and red states, including, of course, right here in Wisconsin, where appropriations per student have been cut 5% over the past five years. This reality makes the need for partnership, I think, even more urgent. Now, I think you've already made strides here. It's impressive to me that the University of Wisconsin, the Wisconsin Association of Independent Colleges and Universities, the Wisconsin Technical College System have all signed a pact to achieve that goal of 60% of Wisconsinites earning post-secondary credentials by 2027 and have pledged to actually work together to meet it. At Lumina, we've also seen terrific community partnerships to increase post-high school attainment, including uh, in other ways uh, here in Wisconsin. Lumina chose Racine and Kenosha as two of 17 talent hubs across the U.S. Though both communities are seeing rising poverty due to lost jobs, they're fighting back with faster pathways to learning and mapping community resources to offer proactive, caring support for students. In fact, they're, they're literally meeting today in Denver to talk with those other 15 communities around the country about this work. I urge you to take the lead in using the insights you glean from these partnerships to show us how community leaders, employers, and educators can actually team up to improve learning. It goes without saying, but let me just underscore that learning really is at the heart of everything we're talking about. And this brings me to my fourth and final recommendation, that degrees and other credentials must represent learning that's crystal clear to employers, to educators, and of course to the learners themselves. I want to say, especially to the students who are here today, that this issue of transparency of learning isn't some abstract concept. It's very real. One key reason why improving transparency is so important through efforts like uh, the degree qualifications profile that Lumina supported is that it will help shine a light on what you'll, you'll know and what you can do out in the world after earning a high quality degree. The vast majority of jobs being created today require college degrees 
because the workplace is becoming far more complex. So you're making a very smart choice in pursuing a degree. But we also have to ensure that your degree specifically and directly meets the needs of what you'll be doing in today's workplace and as a member of today's society. For instance, your choice of a major is certainly important, but what we hear frequently from employers is that in addition to the major, the actual knowledge and skills acquired are what most help individuals thrive in the workplace. The 2015 study found that nearly all employers, 91%, agreed that for career success, a candidate's demonstrated capacity to think critically, communicate clearly, and solve complex problems is more important than the choice of major. Even more employers, 96%, agree that all college students should have experiences that teach them how to solve problems with people whose views are different from their own. We need to make sure all students have opportunities for learning that lead to these necessary high-level skills. Now, when I was gathering information for my book, uh, America Needs Talent, which by the way, uh, we bought a free copy for all of you here today, uh, on the back table there. I run a foundation, it's literally the least we could do. Um, I, uh, I met with educators and students and government, government officials, uh, Fortune 500 CEOs, innovators, Democrats, Republicans, and, and everybody in between. You know, just about everybody that I talked to said our country is in trouble, in danger of losing our global leadership, on track to leave a less prosperous future for our children. I finished the book before the last election. At the same time, we hear a growing chorus questioning the value of higher education. So let me say as forcefully as I can to those who uh, willfully denigrate the post-secondary learning enterprise that I think they do as much damage to our country as any threat you could imagine. And those of you on the front lines and working to make a real difference as faculty, as students, and as leaders are the bulwarks against those cynical efforts. Yes, change is needed but it must be aimed at creating more opportunity, not less, especially for those who've been denied that opportunity and who can most benefit from a high quality post-secondary education. <clears throat> what made the 20th century the American century was a belief in the power of learning and policies that help people take advantage of it. We had the GI Bill, desegregation, Pell Grants, and a thirst for science education in the wake of Sputnik. Today, in peril of losing the gains we've made, we must strengthen and modernize the current system. We must speed our progress to help those who are motivated <clears throat> to improve their skills and their learning, but see college as out of reach. And we need, once again, to make post-secondary education our highest priority. That, more than anything else, will determine if we as a democratic nation can continue to foster the economic opportunity and social mobility that have been the hallmarks of American greatness for more than 100 years. Sustaining that greatness by developing and unleashing the talents of all of our people is really what today's conference is all about. Thank you all very much. So my, uh, my Uncle Cliff says I can take some questions and comments. Uh, and I'm uh, really looking forward to hearing from all of you. And um, I take questions, I take critical feedback. Um, I do this for a living, so there is no uncomfortable question for me. There are sometimes uncomfortable answers, but there are no uncomfortable questions. So please uh, feel free to uh, get up and ask me any question you want to ask about this or anything else. Yeah, Professor Hillman. Good morning. Thank you for the remarks. Uh, can everybody hear me fine? So I'm left to wonder with all of the change that's necessary and all the innovation that's ahead of us, uh, what do you, how do you know when to stop with innovation? How do you know when an innovation is, is ready to um, be put back on the shelf? Yeah. Is there a way to diagnose that? 
Yeah, I, probably never, right? I think the point of, of the enterprise, I mean, so we in higher education have been, have been the engines of economic and social progress, uh, you know, at least since the days of the Morrill Act, right? Like we, we have been the, uh, uh, the sort of foundation of that um, innovative uh, American, the idea of, of America. So I think it never stops. I do think, uh, I've been spending a lot of time in Silicon Valley uh, in the last few years, a lot of time, and there are some great and wacky ideas coming out of Silicon Valley. Uh, part of our task here is to sort through the great from the wacky and to figure out how we actually apply them towards these outcomes that I was talking about today. Uh, we have an enormous challenge in our country, which is that talent is really going to be the difference maker about whether you are a have or a have not in American society. It already is today, but it's going to become so much more pronounced. And innovating our way towards improving those opportunities, equity is the work, as I said, I think is really important. So I don't know that we have any quantitative or even qualitative measures that we might actually be able to apply. What I do know is that the current system has been inadequate to meeting the needs of what we have as a society for individuals <laughs> and for all of the individuals that collectively make up that society. And uh, you know, I think that we're gonna have to innovate our way towards a much different model. Uh, I will say a couple of other things, uh, and it sort of goes back to the, the issue of the, uh, the conversations in Silicon Valley. Um, there are a lot of voices, not just in Silicon Valley, but, but in other parts of the world that are fundamentally questioning the value of this enterprise, right? They literally are not sure that higher education matters. And I think we can either circle the wagons and be defensive, or we can fight our way out from the middle and say, here's what we're about, here's what matters, but also here's how we're gonna transform ourselves to meet society's needs here in the 21st century. And in order to do that, it means that we've gotta be less responsive and defensive to the proposed changes and more proactive to what's really going on. So you look at some of these innovations that I talked about in my prepared remarks, and these are really sort of snowflakes, right? They are not systemic change efforts yet. We've got to figure out how to bring some of these big ideas to scale. Uh, you know, I'm, I'm curious to know if, if anybody uh, sort of has a, a big uh, issue with the Georgia State model. I look at the Georgia State model, and I think, boy, there's a lot we could learn from that we could, that we could apply at a bigger scale. Will it apply to everyone? No, of course not. I think one of the great things about American higher education is its diversity and you know, the fact that we have two and four year colleges, historically black colleges, public uh, research universities, uh, private independent colleges, all of that is I think a, a great success to, of, of what we have. But I, I do think that um, everyone's gotta learn from the places that are actually defying the odds and developing a better ideas. And, and I think that that process of innovations is not gonna end. Yes? Jamie, um, I, I appreciate your recommendation about uh, partnerships with schools, with K-12 schools and universities. Are there examples of um, places that are doing that really well in terms of early childhood education, um, you know, creating opportunities before kids get to uh, middle school, high school? It seems like in the, I, I work a lot in K-12, and one of the things that we hear a lot about is a lot of kids, you know, early childhood opportunities are not as they should be. So a lot of kids, by the time they get to seventh and eighth grade and into high school, you know, they're, they haven't been served well. So are there yeah. examples of, of partnerships that, you know, start early, uh, thinking of college access at an early age? Probably. Uh, so, uh, you know, there's, there's, a, there's a fundamental problem with, with, the, uh, with, with those partnerships. And it, it sort of goes to a, um, a reality of, of what education is. So education is essentially a temporal process, right? So you get educated as early as you possibly can and you hopefully continue to be educated all the way through a, a course of a lifetime. Uh, and in a different speech, I've been arguing that this idea that first you learn and then you work is no longer going to be the mode going forward, that working and learning are going to truly be integrated uh, in the future and that we're we're going to have to figure out how to sort of ratchet that process over the course of a person's lifetime. But the temporal process is really complicated because 
people move among institutions, you know, American uh, migration and mobility patterns being what they are, uh, it makes it very difficult to make those handoffs. And so it is difficult to follow people from one place to another to another and take them all the way through. Places like the Harlem Children's Zone have tried to do that. And the interesting thing about the Harlem Children's Zone is that so Harlem Children's Zone literally has, they call it baby college, right? Like they get to the parents in the prenatal time and they try to follow them through all the way through, follow the cohort of kids all the way through to, to college. And we've actually supported some of the work that they're doing with the, with the people who've gone through at least some element of it, haven't been around forever, and who are now uh, in, in college. But there's a huge attrition, right? There's a huge attrition of people who literally leave Harlem, who, you know, who, who go somewhere else. And so they, they fall through the cracks of that system. And that suggests that these sort of geographically bound models might not be the right way to do it, right? So uh, people live and work in communities, that's true. But because of mobility, we've got to figure out how to create a different framework so that we don't lose the handoffs among the interventions that we know work. And a lot of people do slip through the cracks on their path to and through a college education. And that's, uh, that's one of the limitations. So I literally, I was in Silicon Valley this week and uh, was meeting with some of, the, um, uh, some of the large tech companies that are looking finally seriously at significant investment in higher education. Most of them have worked in sort of early childhood or in some cases in a sort of middle school type intervention efforts. And you know, what we were talking about was literally this issue, which is how do you create these platforms so you know we're funding organizations so that the people that are actually doing the work can create the handoffs among them. Some of that has to do with the data systems, but data isn't where people live, right? Data is just a, a representation of, of who they are. And so figuring that out is is really hard. And I don't think we have significantly scalable models. You know, I've been an advocate for, for TRIO and for Gear Up and, and programs like that, but even those long-standing programs have real difficulty with, with those handoffs. So it's, it's, it's a challenge that I think we've got to confront. I'd love, uh, frankly, the, um, the, uh, the uh, ingenuity of the research community on this question. I think it would be really valuable for us to, to try to think through how to, how to develop uh, better pathways and, and you know, this, this issue of pathways of learning and sort of meeting people where they are is a pretty significant part of our, our, of our work at Lumina Foundation, but it's, it's still within certain lanes of, of learning, right? You sort of want to make sure that you get somebody who's starting in a community college and gets them into, into the next learning opportunity, whether it's workplace-based or a four-year institution or whatever. I think the, the, the broader question of pathways is, is, is really challenging. Yes? I've noticed that, yeah. <laughs> yeah. So I'm wondering how you as the leader of the foundation pivot, in turn, if you do, as administrations change hands, and specifically within Wisconsin, um, so it's kind of a two-part question. In Wisconsin, some of us at the university might feel that we're not fully supported by a state legislature. Sure. Yeah, it's a really, it's a really challenging question. Um, a, a little bit of personal reflection before I get to it. So, I ran a bipartisan federal commission in the early 1990s uh, in in Washington, appointed by the president, the congressional leadership. Cliff and I were talking about this a little while ago. Uh, I had, um, I'm, I'm a political centrist, so I'm not aligned with either political party. I spent my whole life in the middle. It's very lonely right now. Um, um, but the the uh, commission was five Republicans and four Democrats and uh, operated during the era of the first President Bush, President George H.W. Bush. But our report came out uh, right after President Clinton was inaugurated. I had nine members of the commission. We issued a unanimous final report. And our major recommendation was what is now argued is one of the most liberal ideas that's actually gotten into federal policy, which is the creation of a direct student loan program. 
So uh, we were not the people that invented the idea, but we were the ones that popularized it. And it was a five Republicans and four Democrats. So it shows you how much things have changed in this era that there is no way I could do that today. I know that. I, I know that that would be extremely difficult. Um, and so part of what I've learned in the, in the 25 years since then uh, is that um, a, a few things. The first one is that you have to keep going at those people who don't get it. You cannot write them off. Um, having uncomfortable conversations is it's important to do. Um, so sort of staying within your lane and only talking to the people who agree with you is not a strategy for success. Uh, it's not fun. Um, but you got to do it. You got to try to meet people where they are. Um, come prepared with evidence. Uh, make sure that you're actually, you actually know what you're talking about and uh, be willing to share that evidence. And, and this is the hardest part, I think, for the enterprise of higher education. Be willing to commit to change. Some of what they're talking about has to be right. I mean, some of it has to be right in the sense that we clearly have a problem here. I tried to outline some of what that is. This system is not serving all of the people it should be serving. And in the context of, that we're in, I am not convinced that only more resources is the answer to the question. I'm in favor of more resources. I want to be 100% clear about that. But I think our strategy as advocates for this enterprise is not to do more with less. Who the hell wants to do more with less? Can you know anybody that would want to do more with less? That's, a, that's just a terrible, like, all right, yeah, let's all rally around that. We should do more with what we've got. And if we can do more with what we've got, we're going to prove that we deserve more investment. That, I think, is the fundamental strategy here. Um, we have, we have uh, this goes back to well before the current political environment, we have largely lost the public benefit argument of higher education. Um, we have really, really struggled with this issue. We did a little bit of this to ourselves, if I can be candid. Um, I can even remember back in the 90s, um, some of our friends, David, uh, leading university presidents, talking about you should come to our university because at the end of the day you're going to make more money. Which is true. That's a, that's a good outcome. But when you start making that argument too much, all of a sudden people say, well, that's the only outcome that should matter then, right? And you say, no, wait a minute. Uh, you know, there's public, private, social, and economic benefits that come from higher education. You've got to make the case for why all of those things together are important. But, you know, I do think that this question of investment and allocation of resources, uh, money talks, and figuring out how to make the case for here's the results we're achieving with what we have, and here's the results we could achieve if we got 5% more, if we got 10% more. I think that's got to be a, a, a significant part, part of the equation. But um, I, um, I'm, I'm with you. These are really, really hard conversations. And um, the hardest ones, I meet with uh, you know, governors and members of Congress uh, you know, every month. Uh, you know, I spend, spend a lot of time talking with those people. And, um, sometimes they're gratifying. Uh, the hardest ones are the ones where uh, they start with the five most dreaded words um, that I hear in these conversations when I was in college. Um, uh, because then you're starting from a very different point. You have to sort of explain that people my age don't know what it's like for the people who are engaged in the post-secondary learning system today. The buildings look the same. You know, a few of the professors are still the same people, but the enterprise is very different. The enterprise is very different. It's serving different people, it has different objectives, and the art of, of learning has changed over the course of that time. It has changed. Uh, but, I, you know, I'm certainly one of those people saying it needs to change more. Keep, keep hitting me, yes. The, none of these are hard yet. I'm waiting for a hard one, yeah. Yeah, that's you. Yeah. I'm, I, I understand that a lot of what you do is partnering with, um, you say, a lot of energy comes from Silicon Valley. Could you stand Valley. up, please? Okay. Oh, I'm sorry. Just so people can hear you. Uh, a lot of your partnering is, you say you meet a lot with Congress people. Yeah.
Yeah. Yeah, thank you, and thank you for that question because um, I do not want to leave you with the impression that the only people that we are dealing with is influencers. We do want to influence the influencers uh, for, for a lot of reasons. Um, the bulk of our investments are really in what you're talking about. So, for example, I mentioned those uh, talent hub communities that we've identified, 17. We're actually adding several more in, in the coming weeks. Um, those are all investing in organizations, partners, that are actually working with those very populations. So the, those investments, the, the prerequisite is that you've got to be working directly with those populations and improving success rates for them. So, so that's an example. Um, we do a lot with um, organizations that are working to sort of improve uh, success for marginalized students. So we've done a fair amount of work with minority serving colleges and universities, uh, sort of black colleges, American Indian tribal colleges, and Hispanic serving institutions, which as uh, a sort of common uh, issue that Cliff and I have, have worked on over the course of our, of our careers. And um, we worked specifically with faculty that we're trying to work more with faculty around the issues of learning and on uh, figuring out um, how to actually uh, better understand. So what, what, what does a history degree mean? You know, what, what does a degree in graphic design actually represent? And then how do the faculty members actually improve their own abilities uh, to increase their success rates there? So, so we've done a, a, a lot of that work. We, we recently um, uh, made some uh, investments, and uh, I just want to mention this quickly because we got a little bit of uh, press uh, attention for this, uh, though that is really not the reason we did it. Uh, focused specifically and, and uh, explicitly on racial justice. Um, we sort of looked each other in the eye after Charlottesville and said, you know, L Lumina's got to sort of, as I said, we've made all these investments in supporting these underserved populations for a very long period of time, but we've got to be really explicit about this issue of, of racial justice and equity. And so we, um, we uh, invited a series of proposals from college and universities that are directly working on improving racial justice um, we got an astonishing response to it. We were completely overwhelmed and impressed, and now we're nervous that we don't have enough money to be able to do all we want to do. But we got proposals from over 300 colleges and universities uh, for this for this grant initiative, which was very impressive. So um, our efforts are aimed there, but I don't I don't want to sound defensive. I think we could be doing more. Um, I think that this idea of um, my, my current board chair is the best board chair I've ever worked with, and he has this uh, uh, theory of, of change where he says the key to change is you got to apply top-down pressure, bottom-up pressure, and then communicate like hell in the middle. And um, uh, he's right. Uh, he's right that you don't create change from the top only or the bottom only. You've got to do it both ways. Uh, that's the uh, uh, that's the best way to sort of. And keep the analogy going to improve the squeeze to juice ratio here is uh, you got to make sure that you keep applying pressure in, in both, both directions. I saw one more over here. Yes. So as an underrepresented student that has navigated this campus, both undergrad and graduate, and now working for the university um, and having different lived experience and work experience, is I find that it's really hard to navigate Yeah, it's a it's a it's a sobering and profound point, right? Which is that, and um, I hope I say this the right way, but University of Wisconsin Madison is in a privileged position, right? It is a, an elite university, and I know you're struggling with resources and lots of other things, but it is an elite university. 
the irony is that the elite universities are struggling, even though they've got the greatest capacities, and the places that have fewer resources, I think James is going to talk about this in a minute, places that have fewer resources um, than others have actually seen uh, some success. There's something we can learn from that. There's something very important that I think we can learn from that, which is that we've got to figure out how to walk the walk on the egalitarian rhetoric that we uh, that we espouse uh, in, in these places. And, you know, what does that mean? Um, that means being really inclusive up front um, in all of the work that we're doing. Um, so um, I've been on too many uh, college campuses, I'm not, I'm not referring to Madison here, but I've been on too many college campuses where the university's got five objectives and diversity or inclusion or equity is one of those. Uh -uh. Now, that, that, that's got to be the sort of underpinning of everything else that you do, right? If that's not the sort of core of what you're doing, it's not going to lead to that outcome. Because let me tell you, uh, human behavior is what it is. The advantage want to keep their position, and the disadvantage are always going to be fighting to try to get what the advantage have. The only way you turn that table, you know, turn the tables on that, is you say our common objective across all of the work that we're doing is equity. It is to improve equity for, for everyone who's, who's benefiting from this. And so, um, so you know, that's sort of one, uh, one way to do it. Um, I do think, uh, not to sort of compliment the sponsors here, but, uh, you know, entities like Wiscape are really important, right? They provide a, a, a platform, a, a, a convening place, a venue, because they're matching scholarship with actually bringing people together to talk about these things. That's really important. And... Um, in our increasingly technology-mediated society, looking each other in the eye and saying, well, we're doing something wrong here, how do we fix this, is really important. And at a place like this, for someone like you, who lived the student experience and is now uh, trying to sort of change the system from, from, from the inside, I think listening to what you are saying is a really important part of that. You know, it's a, it's a really critical element uh, of, the, of the work. And so, uh, you know, I think I think making sure that we create these kind of spaces is is important. Um, I apologize for too many self references to Lumina, but we've really, really worked at this in our own context at Lumina. That you know, we've had this equity imperative that I referred to for a long period of time. We had to sort of do the same thing. We had to look each other in the eye and say, "Are, are we actually living this?" Or is this a part of, you know, just sort of what we're, what we say we're about? Uh, and we have worked very hard at it. Um, and um, I think we've got some measures of progress that we can point to, but I think we, we, we've got a ways to go. A couple more, I think. Yes, ma'am. Yeah. Right. But if we don't deal with the recipe yep. and the ingredients, we 
I, I hear you, and and uh, extremely extremely well said. Um, I'm going to uh, I'm going to take your challenge and try to define what pre preparedness is, and then feel free to critique me. Um, I wanted to say um, a, a little bit more about what you were saying at the beginning, which was um, this issue of the sort of blame game, uh, the, the finger pointing. Um, it's real, and, and it is a problem. Um, it is a problem, and we see it at every level. We see the educators doing it to each other. We see the policymakers doing it. So, you know, again, I spend too much of my time with policymakers, so the policymakers say, now, remind me again, was I, didn't I pay for that in K-12? Why am I doing remediation now in college? And, uh, you know, you have to explain to policymakers that, well, yes, however, a large proportion of remediation has nothing to do with K-12 deficits. It has to do with the fact that uh, they're adults or whatever. And some of remediation is because of, of what you talked about, but most importantly, it's morally and economically suicide to just say we're not going to pay for remediation because now you're really shooting yourself as a, in the foot as a state because they didn't get the preparation the first time around and now they're not going to get it. So, so how have you solved the state's problem by saying we're not going to pay for remediation? Um, so to me, I think that we have had um, so we've had a conversation that is probably well intended but has not gotten at the real issues of the lived experiences of the students we're trying to serve. And the problem is that we tend to try to tackle an element of their life circumstances rather than the totality of it. And so um, I, th I think of this as a sort of three-legged stool. Um, students have academic, financial, and social issues that all come together that determine whether or not they are prepared. So my definition of proper preparation is that you've got to make sure that they are academically, socially, and financially prepared for college. And we, at a public policy level, have mostly focused on the academic side, um, particularly in terms of sort of, quote unquote, improving K-12. Um, and there's obviously been some conversation about the financial side, very little about the social side. And some of what you were talking about is really what I would include in the sort of social emotional elements uh, that are that are really important, which is things like how do you manage your time, how do you, you know, there's all kinds of things uh, that are extremely important. So applying this lens of academic, financial, and social uh, preparation as co-equals in the equation, um, I think would be would be a really important step forward for those of us who are working on this side to sort of assess the you know, what's happening in K-12, how do we help them in K-12 do a better job of academically, financially, and socially preparing the learners that are going to come to us? And then how do we make sure that we take that handoff that I was talking about earlier and do the same thing academically, financially, and socially when, when they get here? Um, to me, it's at least a different way of, of thinking about it. Uh, we tend to, again, sort of zero in on, you know, look, I'm a first-generation college student. I'm a Cliff mentioned I'm, I'm a walking advertisement for every financial aid program you, you could think of. Um, but I also had to go to college as the first in my family, you know, who had no prior experience with all of these deficits. You know, I, I, I told people the story recently that I, I showed up at Bates College on my first day having never visited the campus. Nobody told us you were supposed to visit a college campus before you, before you went there. Literally, nobody told us. You know, we're an immigrant family. I was like, oh, really? And that's like, all these people are like, oh, you know, when I was here and I visited, I was like, oh, that would have been a good idea for me. I didn't think to do that. You know, so there's things that are the lived experiences of these students, socially, academically, and financially, that are really important to, to take, in, take into account. And I think that's uh, at least a different starting point for this conversation. Cliff, how are we on time? Do I have time for one more? Uh, yeah, I think one more question. Okay. Oh boy, I gotta pick it up. Oh okay, yeah, you've had your hand up for a while, so yes. So, uh, I have a hand. How do we connect with the students who have gone through the grade twelve system and have not done well? They maybe took three tracks. They didn't get the wraparound care when they were hungry, not safe at home, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera, as you mentioned. Um, and now they don't trust the educational system. Yeah. Workplaces to get them in that way. I, I 
Yeah. It's a, it's a tough uh, challenge. I'm going to sort of, I'm going to pile on to your point and then try to answer your question. But, but um, so we have a, um, we have this terrific um, new organization that we're partnering with called Working Nation. It's a really interesting entity. So they're, they're, what they're doing is they're doing storytelling to try to improve understanding of the real challenges that people who um, are in the workforce who are struggling have and how that connects to the sort of inadequacies of the learning enterprise. And uh, there's um, a bunch of sort of really impressive award-winning journalists behind it, including, for you sports fans in the room, the, the woman who created 30 for 30 on ESPN is one of the principals of this thing. So really, really powerful storytellers. So she was interviewing um, in, in Indianapolis, where Lumina is, the carrier workers, right? You know, the sort of... <laughs> really uh, politically um, uh, focused group because of President Trump. And she sort of um, sat down with them and talked to them about, so um, why haven't you sort of gone back and improved your skill level to sort of take you to the next level? And in, in the process of that, she presented all the evidence to them about why that would be important. And um, they said, yeah, yeah, we got that, we heard that, we, we know that, we heard that before. It's not me. I can't do it. I can't do it. So I think there's a problem there, which is that, um, several problems. One is that we've got to figure out how to meet them where they are, right? So trying to get them to come back to campus and sit in a classroom in a sort of structured learning environment might not work for some of them. Or maybe for some of them, the solution is to actually do that in, in a real level of intensity, right? Which is to get them into a block schedule, highly intensive effort where all they do is do that and actually pay them for it, right? So there have been these experiments with this now that we've seen that are really interesting, uh, which is that um, students who go to school nine to five and then they get a stipend to actually go to school and they complete their programs much more rapidly than people who are trying to do it while working and learning, pretty interesting. Or you try to embed the learning in the workplace uh, for the individuals who are doing that, that requires a certain enlightened uh, work, you know, uh, employer to, to do that, uh, but figuring out how we meet them uh, where they are um, is really important. And, um, you know, that data that I mentioned at the beginning of my remarks is really stark. You know, we sort of saw over the series of recessions going back to the early 80s that the jobs that got eliminated were coming back in smaller and smaller numbers, but the 2008 recession sort of fundamentally changed the game here. Those jobs did not come back. And your ability to be a part of the middle class is almost perfectly aligned with whether or not you go to college or get a post-secondary credential from, from some you know, high quality uh, enterprise. And so there's a real urgency here to figure out what you're talking about because um, there are a lot of people for whom, even in the face of the evidence about what the benefits are, you know, salary, um, work-life balance, uh, improve social conditions, all that. They just can't see themselves doing it. And so we have to help them get there by reducing the friction for them. Um, um, you know, maybe technology is a part of this in, in some ways, but figuring out how we do that is, is really urgent. We've tried to experiment with several of these things at Lomina to try to get some of the best ideas, but I don't think we're there yet. And uh, I think it's a, it's a really important issue for us to tackle. Thank you all very much for the chance to be here.